Well, Lydia and Jayu is probably never going to have to wonder if her children love her. They're, they're probably never going to ask the question, Mom, do you love us? After what happened in their small uh, Eskimo village in Quebec. It was late, uh, late winter, early spring, and her boys were playing ice hockey on an outdoor ice hockey rink, on an ice rink. When they heard, when she heard them screaming, and so she ran from her house out to see her boys on the ice rink facing a 700-pound polar bear. And so they're yelling, and in that moment, she has to decide what to do. And what she decided to do was run in between her boys and the 700-pound polar bear. She tells her boys, take off, run, get some help. And she's still standing there now all alone with the big polar bear. When he finally reaches up and he swats her with his front paw, it hits her on the shoulder and in the head, and she gets battered and bruised, and she's bleeding just a little bit. She's knocked down on the ice when the polar bear comes right over the top of her. And Lydia says she was laying on her back. She put her feet up and started kicking in a bicycle pedaling motion, just trying to get this thing off of her. She said, I thought I was going to die when a shot rang out. The bear recoiled and fell dead on the ice. Love compelled Lydia. She had no gun. She had no knife. She's got nothing. She describes herself as five foot nothing, 90 pounds, taking on a 700-pound polar bear. But that's what love makes you do. You see, love won't allow you to spectate and watch. Love compels action. And this morning, I want to talk about what I believe that the love of God is compelling our church to do. Love will compel you to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And there are some aspects of our life together and the mission that God has given us that is going to require boldness and sacrifice and service over the next few years. I believe that God is opening doors for our church for him to do great things, both for us and through us to a world around us. For the last eight to ten months, I've really been wrestling with something personally. And here's what it is. Um, This summer, I will have been here 15 years. And I began to ask God the question, God, is there something more? Uh, are, Are there things for me to do here? Do you want me to lead our church in a specific direction? Is there something for us to accomplish and um, I, I don't do really good in the caretaker chaplain role. Um, I, I'm, I'm much more of the vision, let's go take a hill role. And I just asked God, Lord, show me what it is you want me to do. And he began to reveal some things to me. And uh, I began to bounce it off of leaders in our church. And back in January, our staff, and then more recently, our deacons had a couple of meetings in which we discussed what I'm going to talk to you about today. And what I really believe is that God is giving me a framework to share with you for the next five years. That's why we're calling this Vision 2028. That this isn't, these aren't things that will happen overnight. Some of them will happen sooner than others, obviously. But over the next five years, I think God has some great things for his people, our church, in order for us to accomplish. I believe that God wants us to work toward, now obviously it doesn't happen completely, but fulfilling the great commission in our generation. And so uh, that's what I wanted to share with you this morning. And I want to do that from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 because I believe this is a passage that relates to the concept of whatever it takes. The Apostle Paul is talking about his compelling love for lost people. Regardless of whether they were Jews, people who lived under the law, or Gentiles, people who were without the law of God. And Paul says that whatever it takes is what I want to do to reach people who are far from God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, Paul says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became a Jew. So that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, 
though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. Now here's the line that I find absolutely compelling. I have become all things to all men, so that I might by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Paul says, I do all things to all men. I become all things to all men so that I might by all means save some. That is a whatever it takes attitude. And I want our church to adopt whatever it takes as our mantra and motto moving forward to reach lost people with the gospel of Jesus. Now, when we talk about church, we need to clarify a couple of things. One is this. What is our purpose and then what is our plan? See, when it comes to our purpose, we don't get to make this stuff up. I don't get to cook up what I decide the purpose of the church is. The purpose of the church is determined by the founder of the church, and that's Jesus. Jesus gets to tell us what to do. We have to work together to discern how to do it in our cultural context. But Jesus tells us what to do. And the command of the church is found in the Great Commission. It is simply this, make disciples. That's what we're called to do. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, go Therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In those two verses of Scripture, there's one commandment, one imperative, make disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is best described as a fully committed or a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple is. So if we're called to make disciples, how do you make one? That would be a really big question. A few years ago, 15 as a matter of fact, <laughs> I preached a message in which I laid out a very simple strategy for what it takes to make a disciple. I still think it communicates well, so I'm going to go back and grab some of that and, and present it to you sort of in an abbreviated form. Here's what it takes to make a disciple. The first is a decision. A person has to make a decision to repent of their sin and believe the gospel, believe Jesus died on the cross, was raised from the dead in order to be saved. Occasionally in Wichita Falls, Texas, a place that um, I, I love. Oh, I love living here. I just want you to know that. I love being a part of this community. But there is an attitude here that I find often, and if you talk to people about the gospel, you'll find it too. I ask someone, you know, if they're a Christian, kind of in a conversation, we get around to that point, they say, yes, I am. I say, how long have you been a Christian? And they respond, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. That's not possible. Now, it may be that you've always gone to church. It may be that you've always been raised in a Christian family that gave you a wonderful heritage, and I'm thankful for that. But you have to decide to be a Christian. You have to choose by faith to trust Jesus Christ to become a Christian. That's how you become a Christian. But that's not the only way that discipleship is made, that a disciple is made. That's the first step. The second step is what I call development. Now, some people would say discipleship right here, but it repeats the word, number one. And number two, people have a concept of discipleship that is sitting around a table and listening uh, to a lecture and a Bible study, and that's how we're discipled. Bible study is a vital part of discipleship, but community is also a part of that. That's why we push life groups here. That's why we think life groups are so very important because people grow best in community, with people who are walking through similar struggles and, and people who've been through similar struggles. And so we can help one another and we can, we can encourage one another and pray for one another. And that's where our ministry is done best, in life group together. So the first step is that I, am, I make a decision to follow Christ. The second step is I'm being developed to be like Christ. I'm growing spiritually. But there is a third aspect to being a disciple, to being a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And that is 
what we call deployment. I've always found that that word works really well in our community because our military folks, they, they get it. That's when you take the decision that you made, the development and the growth that you've experienced, and you use it in serving, that you go do something for the kingdom of God. One of my best friends in the world is a guy named Bobby Allen. Bobby uh, spent 30 years in the Marine Corps. And I've always hoped this illustration doesn't um, offend my Air Force folks, but I think actually you can relate to it, okay? Because Bobby heard me preach this once, and he said, Bob, that's just like me. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there was no draft when I became a Marine. He said, I, I made a decision to be a Marine. I, I signed on the dotted line, and I put my hand up, took the oath of service, and and in that moment, I became a Marine. I made a decision to be a Marine. And then they took me to boot camp. And they shaved my head and gave me ill-fitting clothes and put a 70-pound knapsack on my back and made me march till I thought my feet were going to fall off. And I lost 20 pounds. And then I figured out why those clothes were so ill-fitting because then they kind of began to fit. And, and he, said, he said they began to train me and they made me into a Marine. See, he made a decision to be a Marine. In that moment, he became a Marine, but he was developed. He grew to be a Marine. He, he was, he was uh, trained to be a Marine. And then he said this to me. I won't ever forget this part. He said, but Bob, that's not the day I became a Marine. The day I became a Marine was in 1991 when Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq, had invaded a tiny nation called Kuwait. I realize this is 28 years ago, ancient history for some of you. But we and a coalition of nations decided to liberate Kuwait. And we sent Air Force, Marines, Army, Navy into the Persian Gulf to liberate Kuwait. And my friend Bobby Allen was a regimental sergeant major in the Marine Corps. And he put his boots on the ground in that Saudi Arabian sand. And what he knew was that over that sand dune is somebody who wants to kill me. And the people I'm dependent on are to my right and my left, and that's what I've got. He said, in that moment, I became a Marine when I was deployed to serve. Some of you in this room who've been military, you could absolutely identify with everything in Bobby's, uh, Bobby's explanation of what that means. You see, we have been called to make disciples to develop people into people who trust Christ for salvation, grow in Christ to be like him, and serve Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is absolutely urgent. This isn't an option. This, there is an urgency to this. Let me explain why. We are living in the midst of a hopeless generation. There is hopelessness, is just epidemic in our culture. There is conflict all around us. Now, I don't mean like wars. I'm talking about societal conflict, um, uh, cultural conflict, political conflict, and only the gospel of Jesus can bring peace to that. On top of that, I've been doing some research uh, that I've found really startling, and this is really applicable to uh, our high school and college students that I, I didn't know this that psychologists are telling us that this is the loneliest generation that they have ever been able to record. Now, yes, you have that device in your pocket and some of you in your hand right now, not listening to what I'm saying, but you have that device with you and you are texting somebody right now and you are on social media and you have all these connections. But here's what psychologists are telling us. Those connections are just surface. They are so skin deep. I mean, they are just, they're, they're just nothing to them. There's not deep, meaningful relationship and connection in social media and electronic communication. Now, you can get wounded really bad from it, but you can't get healed from it. And we live in the midst of a generation that needs the church, and they don't even know it's what they need. They need the community of the body of Christ, and they don't even know it's what they need. We live in, an, in, a, in a nation that is epidemic of loneliness and hopelessness and conflict. But let me tell you another reason it's urgent. If you're our guest today, you, you probably deserve to know what our church believes. And here's what we believe at the core of everything we're about. 
We believe that every person on planet earth is going to die someday and stand before God. And what you do with Jesus Christ will determine whether you spend an eternity with God in a fabulous place called heaven or you spend eternity separated from God in a horrible place called hell. We believe that because Jesus said it. The Bible teaches it. And it is urgent that we tell people about Jesus. The only source of hope, the only source of acceptance, and the only way to spend an eternity with God. Now, where should we do this? Well, Jesus told us that too in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In Acts 1, 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, before, uh, comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. You see, we are called to make disciples, but not just of our neighbors, of the nations. We are called to go across the street, but we're also called to go across the ocean. We are called to go around the corner, but we are called to go around the world with the gospel. And a church our size can make a difference in the world. And that's what we're called to do. That is what compels me. That is what drives me. Paul says, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means win some, save some. Now let me tell you what Paul didn't mean by that. Because this also begs to be said in a message about change and, and a message about cultural engagement. What Paul did not mean was compromising the message of the gospel. That is what we will not do. We will not compromise the message of the gospel, the moral standards of the Bible. We will not compromise the truth of Scripture simply for our acceptance or to somehow keep us from being canceled by a culture. Who cares if they cancel us? What we're going to do is stand for the truth of the gospel. It doesn't mean cultural compromise, but it does mean this. We live in a cultural context. It's not the 1950s anymore. It's not the 1980s anymore. And we have to meet the needs of this generation today. So based on that, I ask God to give me a framework, a plan. I ask him to give me something. And, and what you're going to hear today is more of a skeleton than it is the fully fleshed out kind of idea. There's a lot more contribution from you that needs to be made to these ideas and a lot more things that we need to sort of put together. But let me give you seven aspects of this framework that I believe God is calling us uh, to move forward on. First of all, there's going to be a reset. Let me explain. We need, first of all, to reset our schedule at the downtown campus. And this one's very simple, and it's not ambitious or bold, but I need to talk to you about it because I want you to understand it. And that is that for a long time, we've had three services at our downtown campus. There's a reason for that. The 815 service became an absolute necessity a few years ago. When we established the church at Shepherd, we... Um, we wanted to have a live sermon, like live worship, and then they saw a live sermon. We figured out real quickly on about the second week that it failed that we didn't have the internet technology and we didn't have the ability to, to get that there. Our internet technology just wasn't, wasn't good enough. So we said what we'll do is we'll have an 815 service. We record the message live, and they see it on the same day, but they'll see the 815 service, and that's what we've done for years. For a long time, the 815 service was over in the East Sanctuary. It was a contemporary service. Then COVID hit. Now, I know some of you are way past COVID, and so are we as a church. But we had to respond to that. Remember, seating people every other row and all that kind of stuff? So we moved the early service into this room. And we established three services. People wanted to spread out a little bit more. We were doing the best we could with the light we had, right? Well, we're past COVID. Um, I'll tell you this, I, let me give you a good report, and, <clears throat> and a lot of this is good news, but we are up to attendance levels that we were at pre-COVID. God has blessed our church. This past two weeks ago on Easter, we had the best Easter attendance we've had since 2017. We even beat 18 and 19 before COVID ever hit. You invited your friends, you brought people with you, thank you for doing that, you did a great job. So we are well past covid but we are also 
right now uh, upgrading our technology to the place that we can have a virtually live sermon at those two campuses, which is really exciting for them and important for them. So the 815 service doesn't become a necessity anymore. And we ask ourselves as a staff, well, what would be the best way to serve our church? And we believe the best way to serve our church would be twofold. One is changing our schedule that at 930 we'll have our blended service and at 11 o'clock we have this service. So, you know, this doesn't cost you anything because you don't have to change a thing. But your friends who go to the 945 service are going to have to rearrange. Life groups are going to have to be arranged, all that sort of thing. However, that creates another problem. See, I tell our staff all the time, we don't really solve problems. We just create new ones that we have to solve. So here's the problem. When we take the 945 service, which is contemporary, and we fold it into this room, eventually we're going to not have any space. Let me tell you when you don't have any space. You don't have any space when you're 80% full or when a family of four cannot come in and sit down together in a row. You're full. It doesn't matter if there's a seat here, a seat there, a seat there. Mom, dad, and two five-year-olds are not going to come sit apart. That's not going to work. So we realize that we're going to have to do something different. That leads me to the second phase of this or the second part of our framework, and that is reviving the East Sanctuary Satellite Service. The first change is going to take place on August 20th on Promotion Sunday. This change would probably take place, we believe, in January. And that is beginning a service in the East Sanctuary, just like our West Campus, just like the Church at Shepherd, live worship and the message from this room projected on the screen. Now, that worship service would probably take a little different style. It would still be contemporary, but maybe a little different to fit the mood in the room. Some of you might even decide that you'd like that better. But we've, we've tried this once before, and it did work for a while, and we believe that it can work again. Now, what that is going to require of us is simply this. We have this room on the east side of our building that is wonderful, it is beautiful, it is large, and it is dormant every Sunday morning. We believe God gave us that room to use. Now, it needs some upgrades and audio, visual, and lighting that's going to cost us some money. And for that reason, you're going to hear about the impact offering. Now, this Vision 2028 is not a fundraiser, but it will take funds to get it done. So let me just tell you honestly that we use our impact offering to fund our church planting, our mission trips, um, some missionaries that we, we personally support as a church, and we always add an aspect of our church. And what we're adding this year is some East Sanctuary upgrades. We're going to need $400,000, $200,000 for missions, $200,000 for the East Sanctuary. And you're going to hear that in the coming weeks. And so I want to ask you to be prepared to give an above and beyond offering in order to accomplish that. We believe that that will position us to reach more and more people for you to be able to invite your friends at an hour when your friends will actually come to church with you. Let me tell you the great deficiency of an 815 worship service. You can't get your friends to come to it. You just can't do it. Nobody wants to get up and go to church at 8.15 on Sunday morning, their morning to sleep in. This will give you an opportunity to invite your friends. Number three, relocate. Now, this is the most ambitious part of this project for sure. Our West Campus is absolutely full every single Sunday morning. The building that we have is filled to capacity. The parking lot is filled to capacity, and we are landlocked at our West Campus. And what I believe God is leading us to do is to begin investigating the possibility of purchasing property, building a building large enough to reach the west side of our city. When you look at Wichita Falls, and when I say this, some of you are going to go, I never thought of that, but it's true. When you look at Wichita Falls, there is only one geographic area that is growing, and that's the west side of town. There is growth going toward Holiday, again, to the west. And because of that, we want to position our church to reach people with the gospel of Jesus. On that side of town, I will tell you that it is by and large, largely unchurched. I got in my truck this morning and backed out of my, out of my house and I counted 10 houses. I know the people who live in these 10 houses. I've met them all. And without calling names, I will tell you that mine included, there were three 
where people go to church, or anybody's church, anywhere. Seven of those homes in my neighborhood, my neighbors, people that I know personally, are not going to anybody's church anywhere. <clears throat> Do you have to go to church to get saved? Absolutely not. But after you get saved, you're going to want to go to church. You're going to want to be with God's people. And I love those people. I've met some of them. They are wonderful people. But they need the gospel of Jesus. And our church needs to be positioned on that growing side of our city in order to reap the harvest of souls that God has placed there. And we're going to need that in order to reach more and more people. Number, number four, refocus. We want to refocus the mission of the church at Shepherd. When we launched the church at Shepherd, there was a strategic goal, and that was that in that region of our city, near the base, if you drew a circle three miles around the front gate of the main gate of Shepherd Air Force Base, there was not a single church running over 100 people. There were seven churches in that circle. There was not a single church running more than 100 people, and there were 20,000 people in the circle. And we said, we got to do something. Now, I told you that um, we are past COVID in most of our church, but there was one aspect of our church that got hurt by COVID more than any other, and that's the church at Shepherd. There were severe restrictions on base personnel about coming to church, about being in gatherings. Uh, it really did hamper the mission of the church at Shepherd. And so what we're looking to do is uh, come alongside our campus pastor, Mark Mackey, who's doing a fabulous job, doing a great job, but we need more workers, more volunteers. And I'm asking 20 people, 20 people to say, I will go to the church at Shepherd. I will work and I will serve. I don't need 20 spectators. We don't need just 20 more people sitting in a chair. But I need 20 people who would say, Bob, for a year, I'll go to the church at Shepherd. I'll join hands with Pastor Mark Mackey. I'll teach a life group or I'll do whatever needs to get done in order to to revitalize and refocus the church at Shepherd on Shepherd Air Force Base and on that veteran community that surrounds Shepherd Air Force Base. If you'd like to do that, if you'd like to be a part of that, 10 days from now, on May 3rd, um, we're going to uh, we're going to do a meeting. Uh, it's not 10 days, but on May 3rd, we're going to do a meeting um, at 6.30 here at the church. I want to give you time to pray about that, but if you'd like to come, we'll give you more information. Number five, and I need to talk to you about number five because I'm going to tell you, I put it at number five for a reason because if I put it at number one, I'd just been talking about it for the whole time and I would have run out of time. I am more excited about number five than anything else on this list. There is a population in our city that we are not reaching, that we're not equipped to reach, and I believe God is calling us to reach them. And that is the Spanish language community of our city. I told you there's one geographic area of our city that's growing. There's also only one demographic in our city that's growing. And that is people of Hispanic heritage. Many of them are Spanish language speakers, perhaps only. And of course, many of them are bilingual, English and Spanish. But they love to worship in their heart language. I am proposing that we create a Spanish language worship service. Now, in the old days, 30 years ago, the old strategy would have been, let's rent a building, uh, let's use our resources, and um, let's, let's fund it, but keep them over there. That is not a winning strategy, and I don't believe it's what God wants us to do. We have plenty of rooms in this church to begin a Spanish-speaking worship service. My proposal is this, we bring on a Spanish language pastor, and that Spanish language pastor and I preach exactly the same passage. We preach the same outline. He probably adds his own personal illustrations, but we preach the same message. We are one church in two languages at our downtown campus. I believe that there is a population in this city that longs for and needs what First Baptist Church can offer them. What we can offer them in our community, in our resources, in our children's ministry, in our student ministry, in our college ministry. They are longing for that. And we bring them on this campus and we don't have a segregated Spanish congregation. We have an integrated Spanish-speaking 
ministry. I'm going to tell you, I'm excited about this. The census says, the U.S. census said that, that about 22% of Wichita Falls is Hispanic heritage. WFISD says that about 40%. Now, what we know is that one of those numbers might be a little overreported, and the census is most definitely underreported because some of those folks are not filling out a federal government document. It's not going to happen. And so somewhere in the middle, but listen to me, please listen. If this city is 30% people of Hispanic heritage, that means there are 30,000 people who are largely unchurched who need the gospel of Jesus. And there is an urgency about reaching people with the gospel. I believe God wants to do great things in order to reach the Spanish-speaking population of our city. Number six is renew. And that is that we renew our church planting emphasis in Salt Lake City. That we come alongside our church planters in Provo and in Logan, Utah and in Salt Lake City in order for the gospel to be advanced in that area. To renew our church planting area, uh, effort and finally to realize, to realize our potential for the gospel. The strategy is what I would call boots on the ground around the world. And that is simply this, that we would as a church begin to travel and go and have a physical short-term missionary presence on every single continent of the globe that is populated. Not Antarctica. I don't think we can win the penguins. But Europe, Asia, Africa, South America, North America, Australia, that we come alongside our mission partners and we send mission teams on site to do mission work. We have boots on the ground around the world. Our church, a church of our size, should not only be going into our neighborhoods, which we should, but we ought to be going to the nations. We can make an impact on our world, and I think God wants us to. I was reading my Bible not too long ago, and this verse just arrested my attention. Psalm 22, verse 30. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. That is the legacy that in five years I want our church to leave. That future generations, those not even born yet, will hear what God has done. That they will hear the wonders of the works of God. And some of you, all of you can be a, all of you can be a part of it. Some of you could be an intimate part of it. Let me, let me give you one. I'm going to talk directly to my college students, but my high school students can listen in. Because it might affect you. Some of you have careers and you're preparing for professions and you've gotten wonderful training at, at Midwestern or wherever you're going to college and you could take your life and stay right here in Texas and be really happy and go to a good church, maybe even ours. Or you could take the skills that God has allowed you to possess and you could go to Salt Lake City and get a job and invest your life in a church plant and advance the kingdom of God. Or you could go somewhere else and invest your life in a church plant where the gospel is not being preached on every street corner and you could make a difference in the kingdom of God. I want to challenge some of you to do that. For some of you parents, you're just cringing because I'm asking your kids to leave home. Yeah. Planes fly there every day, okay? It'll be all right. But I want to challenge some of you to live for more than staying right here in Wichita Falls. That you would live for more than that. That you would go wherever God tells you to go. That you would invest your life in spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your Spirit's guidance. I thank you for 
the way that you have spoken. And now, Lord, I pray that you would take these words and speak to the hearts of your people. Lord, we want our church to be a church that brings honor and glory to the name of Jesus. We want your gospel to be known. We want, Father, for our community to know what we stand for. And more than what, we want them to know who we stand for. That we are people who follow Jesus. God, would you work right now in our hearts first. In Jesus' name, amen.